Hello, everyone. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is March 1st, year 2022, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I hope you're all doing well, and we're back on the regular channel. Hey, isn't that nice? And uh, let me just take a few, well, a few seconds to uh, welcome everybody back into the chat. Hopefully, we'll be able to uh, recapture the audience that kind of got lost in the uh, shuffle. But uh, the more intrepid and uh, persistent audience members have followed me over the past two weeks. And you have observed that uh, my game is still very much operating at a very, very high level. <laughs> in fact, those two weeks away allowed me to really dig in on the whole Ian Fleming thread, which is uh, yielding an incredible wealth of new information into the current state, the current nature of uh, what is known as uh, the um, the captured world, the captured government. By the way, I was talking about uh, state capture months ago. This was way before Peter Schwartz. He calls it elite capture, but it's uh, the, the proper concept is, oh, Norman Smith, thank you very much for the, I didn't realize I was um, qualified for a super chat. This year, my first super chat, Norman Smith. And uh, someday we're going to play. I'm going to do some music. I, I, I got the final piece of equipment last week. Uh, it's a um, vocal processor, so I'll be able to do reverb and, and echo. It'll, it'll sound much more professional. So thank you very much for that. Um, but yeah, um, I've really been following this thread about the um, state capture, as it's properly called. Uh, P uh, Peter Schweitzer is... Um, slightly off kilter there because he doesn't want to talk about states being captured you want you'd rather talk about a part of the state being captured which is supposedly the the elite um but how do you define the elite uh there's just a sort of a small subsection within the ruling class indeed that has been captured not all of them not even uh, the majority of people within uh, corporate communications or corporate sponsored communications or the medical institutions big pharma most of them are um up till recently have been oblivious to the nature of what they're really doing and it's really educated the people in these institutions uh, within themselves it's been educating them as to uh, what the big bosses are doing that gives them an overview so state capture, yeah, that's what it's um, all about. And by the way, just just I wasn't going to really talk about it, but state capture referred to specifically the instance, the historical instance of South Africa. South Africa, especially after supposedly being independent, how its institutions all the way through, through the corporate sector through the judiciary the elective bodies uh, education of course so the health system how that was captured post-colonial and that's what's happened in every single uh post-british occupied and to a certain extent post-french occupied colonial governments uh, state capture and that's where we're at today and uh, so far as it didn't affect us we could afford to overlook it we didn't really care what happened in south africa or other places but all along the United States of America, the so-called developed world, the first world, that was going to be the final domino to fall in this larger system of globalist, centralized, I call it the UNATO, conflating United Nations and NATO, the UNATO Caliphate. And why am I winding up with this? Well, in order for the UNATO Caliphate to achieve its ends, it must, well, we've just got, come, we're coming out of two years and we're, we're not out of it yet. We're coming out of two years of bio warfare being directed against not just the American people, but people around the world. And it's now being fully admitted arrogantly by these corporate heads of uh, the pharmaceutical, the usual suspects. I'm not going to name them. You already know who they are anyway. So let's just keep it cryptic for now, right? <laughs> But uh, it, uh, that's just part of it. Now, I'm going to be talking about the other part that might have been neglected recently. And it's very, very important. And that's the PSYOP part of it, right? 
we know about the people coming after with with the various concoctions, but it's much more subtle. The propaganda system is much more subtle and um, unobtrusive. In fact, it's really even enter entertaining. It's informative and entertaining, and it fulfills a lot of our fantasies and a lot of our needs. And um, we are, after all, very simple creatures, animals. We have a we're capable of incredible abstract thought and um, aspirations, spiritual aspirations, but we're also at a certain level very much vulnerable to operant conditioning. And that's going to be today's talk. That's going to be the nature of today's talk. And as I was getting prepared to discuss one of my favorite authors now, Dennis Wheatley, and I can kick myself for not discovering him. Well, I knew about him, but I didn't really start understanding what Dennis Wheatley meant in, in the form or in the larger context of the world government until I started going in with in on uh, Ian Fleming. And of course, Ian Fleming led me to Dennis Wheatley. And I was already reading Gothic literature anyway. I have another channel. It's called uh, Collegiate Gothic. And I hope to be doing a whole series on another channel, maybe on another platform altogether, maybe even as a graphic novel. I'm trying to, to contact a publisher. It's really hard to sell these ideas because um, these ideas are original. They're really new, and I can't really compare them to too too much uh, other that's you know other product. Let's call it that's that's out there. So it's a it's a difficult sell for me to do it. But once I get over that hump, it'll it'll be okay. But I've been interested in the gothic. Uh, worldview, let's call it the Gothic architecture, the the Gothic uh, Luciferian uh, inflected literature, right? Satanic even, and uh, been very much interested in what uh, Wheatley has been telling us, and it also Wheatley's work also intersects with my pre-existing knowledge and familiarity with the popular writers who are contributing, I'm sorry, contributing to our enslavement via these psyops, right? The entertainment, the, and, and this goes beyond just, oh, it's, it's all propaganda anyway. Come on, we, we need some specificity when discussing this type of stuff. You can't just say, oh, it's a real deep, dark rabbit hole we're going down. To. Yeah, okay, yeah, tell me something new. Specificity is what research is all about. You can talk all you want in, in generalities. This is what I'll leave that to uh, to uh, Babyface Ben Shapiro and uh, uh, the auctioneer uh, Stu Peters and all these other people on CNN or Don Bangino, Dan Bongino. They can talk about all the generalities. That's not what this channel is about. This channel is is about specifics and it's about the real digging deeply into our society, our culture, our social systems, and I call it, for the sake of convenience, um, cultural forensics. So again, I find, uh, and there's a book on it. That's why I'm so into authors. <laughs> you have you have an, uh, a certain insight or, or an inkling, and then someone's already written a book about it. Uh, and this one's called Church Hills, as in Winston, right, who, who likes to, to uh, brag about the fact that his his mother was an american right so we're two great countries divided by a common language uh that winston churchill is much more devious than that of course but he uh this book is subtitled churchill's storyteller dennis wheatley the the spooky writer the horror writer of course he wrote much more than these supernatural books i think there were only about 10 or 12 i Totally, I think he did about 60, 70 books. Very, very prolific. But uh, not very many people know that during wartime, he was writing stories directed against the German enemy for the British government, for MI, MI5 and MI, MI6. To certain. But there was a special subunit within that that was so secretive that he couldn't even hire a secretary. And he was all out of sorts about that because he couldn't spell. He couldn't do any grammar. He could hardly craft a sentence. After all, he was a wine broker. He was a wine dealer in Mayfair, the Mayfair district. 
the hoity-toity areas. And he comes from kind of more humble backgrounds. He also had his nose pressed to the windows of the elite. And finally, he was sitting around the table with some of these people who had gone to school, uh, the military, I guess, Sandhurst, and high-level people of the uh, of the nobility, and even King, uh, King George VI. That was his favorite novelist, Dennis Wheatley. So anyway, we'll, we'll get to Dennis Wheatley um, uh, shortly. Um, so these types of operations are in constant play. And we see them in the past. We see them in the present. And unfortunately, in the popular imagination, people fasten, fasten on one particular author. And they get stuck there. And they think they know everything as a result of being able to name check, let's say, see, who did um, uh, Dave McGowan? <laughs> yeah. They know everything about 1960s popular music because they might have read about, they probably haven't read the book. Um, I have an autographed copy of the book that a friend of mine got me. So I have read the book. I have two copies. I have my own copy and then the autographed copy. So I know the book uh, well. Uh, but they just, they're, they're stuck on that, right? And uh, same with Maury Terry, my friend uh, Manny Grossman is doing a sort of a fact check on that whole book that's been out for 40 years or something like that. And people freak out because he's departing from the orthodoxy. Uh, and I'm telling you this is because some of you are not going to be happy with, it, with, with what I'm about to tell you. And that is that we really seriously have to take a step back and talk about uh, seriously re-examine what's what's now commonly thrown around as trauma right and trauma-based mind control yes i do believe that it does happen but probably not as often as we have been led to believe and that's maybe that's part of the psyop thinking well it's all it's all a giant uh trauma machine that we're fed to to put us into a state of perpetual defensiveness and security and um helplessness learned helplessness if you will so I want to con continue to re-examine that, especially after coming, not coming across, being reunited with a book today, this morning, that seemed to jump out at me off the shelf. I was going to do Dennis Wheatley, talk about his whole, I alluded to it at a previous talk on the other channel, but I was really going to go in deeply into Wheatley uh, today. And um, I was also going to talk about uh, Ira Levin because, and let me take this opportunity to tell you that I've been in touch with one of your favorite authors and favorite guests on this channel, Kirby Summers, that uh, we're going to be doing another show fairly soon, as soon as we get the the date. And she's in different time zone, and she's very, very busy. <laughs> she, <laughs> unlike me, she makes me look like I'm just a sluggard. You know, so her schedule has come together and we're going to talk about some of her recent finds. And it's I'm excited. Well, I'm always excited. I'm especially excited about it because she's going to go in on the mystery man for me. Yes, Ira Levin. So I was so excited in getting her message the other day. I sat down in the morning and by the very next morning I had finished reading this. I rarely do that. I usually take my time when I read and I took my time here, but but I took extensive notes. Uh, here they are here. I, I put them on post-it notes. Then I write a critique and I make my little comments here. And uh, it's called uh, A Kiss Before Dying. This is Ira, Ira Levin's. I'm going to do a little bit of a long introduction today because I want to catch you up on, on coming attractions and what I've been doing over the weekend and how it's going to benefit you and me. Uh, in, in the very near future, and hopefully the larger society, because I want this message to go out to the the mass audience that is being distracted by Dan Bongino and handsome uh, babyface Ben and uh, the auctioneer Stu Peters and all these other people who are supposedly representing independent journalism. It's nothing but a bunch of name calling and uh, just generalities and in outrage, oh, isn't isn't Kamala Harris stupid? Isn't she out? Oh, oh yeah, I guess what they're doing here in that whole CRT stuff, it's old, baby. It is old. That is a giant distraction in itself. And it and it never fails. We we and I caught myself as part of the 
conservative renaissance, we always fall for the the clickbait, right? The name checks. So that's not what I, I do here. And uh, Babyface Ben, if you're listening, and auctioneer uh, Stu Peters, I don't know how the hell you got your jobs and why I'm only 8,000 subscriptions on YouTube. But baby, I'm breathing down your neck. I'm going to shake your chair because I, I got some, some goodies, some substance here that the American people, millions of them, need to hear and will hear and will understand what I'm saying. All right. This is not some sterile intellectual academic exercise here. This is about as real as your own butt that you can't even grab with your own two hands. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about <laughs> the people who are still watching Fox News and CNN. I, mean, I, I watch it every once in a while. I do like Tucker Carlson. Uh, but uh, the other people, uh, what's his name? The guy that's on the radio. And uh, I mean, when does he have time to study? When does he have time to read? Br not Brent Kingman. Uh, some That other guy. I forgot his name. He's on radio and he's on everything. Uh, she's got no time to really think about what he's doing. So, of course, he's just going to recycle a lot of old material. So we're going to go in on uh, Ira 11. And I finished this book. And then I, of course, I have all of them. Uh, bought them ahead of time. Of course, I'm going into Rosemary's Baby. I have some really unique insights there that even the people who have talked about the book, because you can find them on YouTube. There's YouTubers that do these book reviews about Ira Levin and uh, the, the film is always being name chat. Oh yeah, Rosemary's Baby, Roman Polanski. Like as if that tells us anything about what Ira Levin was really about and what he was putting out there so far his, as his messages are are concerned. So we we got into some, Rose. I did first a few chapters of, Rosemary's Baby, which was, see, uh, A Kiss for Be Before Dying came out in 53. This is an old book. You know, this book is as old as me. And then many years later, only many years later, did I, uh, Rosemary's Baby come out. He only wrote about four or five novels. He was not very prolific. So um, I'm trying to figure out what, what occupied him during those gaps. I know he did a lot of television we're allowed to tell he was in the golden age of TV, along with people like Rod Serling. Remember uh, Twilight Zone? Well, there's there were dozens, maybe hundreds of writers like that who came out of World War II or the Korean War who had stories to tell. Ira Levin was one of them. And um, he did a lot of uh, Broadway, did a lot of theater, did a lot of film writing. He wrote... No Time for Sergeants, a, a, uh, an adaptation from a novel made into a film uh, starring Andy Griffith, right? You think Andy Griffith started on The Andy Griffith Show with Opie, right? Later became famous director Ron Howard. No, he started out facing the crowd in movies, Andy Griffith, and then had a film career before television took over everything, right? It was the monster that, that ate cinema. Um, so that's Ira Levin in brief, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we are going to be getting into him in, in great length, uh, thanks to Kirby Summers' research on that, because I certainly haven't found very much out there. He's he's more enigmatic than uh, J.D. Salinger. I never thought I could say that about any other American writer, but J.D. Salinger has, has several books on him written about now. We, everybody knows that he was uh, military intelligence and that he was sort of like um, Bill Barr's daddy and any number of people of that era, CIA, OSS type people, uh, they were controlled writers. And of course, there have been books written about uh, the Iowa, Iowa, University of Iowa uh, Writers Workshop and how that was a CIA offshoot and how most of American letters, particularly in the late 40s through 50s into the present uh, is an offshoot of uh, American and British intelligence because the British are, have a, their hands in American publishing, uh, especially magazines. One of their chief agents is, um, right, um, Anna, what's her face? <laughs> I, I try to blot out her her, her picture, right? But uh, Condé Nast, that whole, that whole net, network there, right? So we're going to go in. And then I was talking to my friend and colleague. We did a Thursday uh, show, a Thursday duo, just this past week here. The last Thursday of the month is when John invites me on as a guest to be on his show. We had a great time, and I was recapping all the finds that I had um, 
you just really kind of fine tune over the, the the month the previous month that we had uh, we had chatted, and uh, we decided yesterday. I said, hey, you know, I'd like to have you on the show, this show here. So you're going to see my friend and colleague John O'Loughlin as an interviewee. Okay, that should be good, and I'll ask him some questions some personal questions uh we we know what he does on his show but and we're we're about the same age we're the same generation we have the same reference points and so i want to ask him about what was going on in his life out in the east coast while i was out here and on the west side yeah supposedly living the california dream (laughs) and uh the intelligence agencies had a big surprise for us Waiting right around the corner. You can, we're giving you the Beach Boys right now. We're giving you Jan and Dean. And you're going to have fun, fun, fun till daddy takes the T-Bird away. But, man, we're going to give you Charles Manson right quick. All right. So we're going to have that kind of discussion. Gosh, I haven't even gotten into the, the topic today, but that's okay. And then finally, uh, for coming attractions, and that's why I, you know, I think these are important figures that that uh, I, I want to share with you the information so you don't miss it. We're going to have Yoichi Shimatsu article coming out soon. I was on the phone with him yesterday and he's got another, it's not a part two of what he did recently, but it's more of the sort of general geopolitical overview of what's going on in the Ukraine, Russia, NATO. And uh, he has a, we had a really interesting long talk. He thinks this is um this is going to be the end of NATO. And I call it the UNATO caliphate. And I said, well, that's really optimistic because usually Yoich is very grim and very sober, very realistic and very centered. And to hear him make such a grand statement like that, I don't, beyond, it was not wishful thinking. Uh, to me, it, it gave me a lot of hope because the UNATO caliphate is really what's behind uh, most of our problems for the past 50 years. And uh, they were going to, I think, close the loop, close the circle, uh, put the T across, cross the T with this recent attack of two over two years ago now. And now we have this uh, this uh, bogus war going on. It's not bogus in the sense that people aren't dying and being injured and wounded and there's not uh, destruction, but bogus in the sense that it is a engineered conflict, as most of these are, as you, you know. So we're looking for Yoichi's article to, to give us, again, specifics, right? Anybody, and he's he's been there, he's lived there. He's going to send me a film, and which I witnessed being made in Nanjing. One of his, his uh, interns in Nanjing, a journalist, uh, Right after she, right before she went to Moscow to live, and and she's already fluent in Russian. She had a Russian boyfriend. She's moving to Russia. She's Chinese, Chinese national, mainland. And so she hosted this show done at the War Museum in in Nanjing, and I was there and was watching. He's going to send me the the video, and if and if I can swing it, I'll try to edit a couple of ta- uh, segments of it and then put it here or put it on YouTube and share it with you. Because uh, unlike uh, Stu Peters, uh, Babyface, uh, Ben, and um, uh, these other characters, I've been there. I've been out there. I've been to these places. Not, and I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I'm not a desk jockey either. And speaking of desk jockey, uh, now that uh, supposedly everything's cool and copacetic and the masks are coming off, maybe I'll be able to hit the road. So I'm I'm not going to jinx myself. I say I'm going to do it, but I'm looking forward to uh, traveling around this great nation of ours, talking to people, and uh, hitting the uh, international scene as well. Uh, I certainly wasn't going to do it uh, at the expense of my health, and I don't mean catching whatever it was out there, but I mean uh, being affected by these concoctions that uh, Big Pharma had waiting for us. And we're going to talk about Big Pharma in a moment because they're a part of the story here. So um, let me talk about this book in particular that jumped off the shelves today. It's called Sybil Exposed, and it's by Debbie Nathan. I've had this book for quite a while. It took a long time for it to grow on me. And finally, I'll tell you how the, the, the coin dropped, the penny dropped, as they say. 
the penny dropped when I started reading about Dr. Peter B. Neubauer, MD, Austrian psychoanalyst, a Jewish refugee, right? Uh, and also uh, this book that he edited. I See, I'm doing backfilling now. I'm reading his work. And I established the connection between another Austrian Jewish psychologist and, and the, the Jewish part is important. It's not just gratuitous because we're talking about an ethnic, uh, ethnic based uh, preoccupation. There's no psychoanalysis in Japan, which where I've lived for two years, different times. There's no psychoanalysis in China. There's very little psychoanalysis outside of Western Europe, right? It's it's primarily a a Western Austrian Jewish Viennese uh, profession that became such thanks to the psyops, including the Sybil psyop, what we're going to talk about. And um, people like uh, Lee Strasberg of the Actors Theater and all these, uh, these celebrities, Hollywood celebrities and intellectuals and musicians, uh, many of them under treatment by another Viennese Jewish uh, psychiatrist named Dr. Max Jacobson or Jacobson, who had a whole laundry list of people that he was giving drugs to, including powerful hallucinogens from, from Leonard Bernstein to whoever, right? And uh, to show you how conscious that Sigmund Freud, the father of Anna Freud, was conscious of this being a Jewish-focused uh, medical practice, one of the reasons why he brought, and this is in the books, this is in the history books, one of the reasons he brought um, uh, Carl Gustav Jung into it, who had his own problems, is because he felt he needed a Christian, he needed a, a goy, a, a, a Gentile, to, to provide some sort of diversity to, to, sh to show to the world that this is a legitimate science, it's not ethnically or racially or religiously based and he's right about that because what it's based on is psycho <laughs> psychopharmaceuticals which doesn't have a race or ethnicity that's really where it's all leading to and i think it by the end of his life and i'm inferring here i think freud was very disturbed what he had, had uh, brought about uh, especially in america he, uh, he did he was a german first and foremost he was a german and, and germans are very serious they take intellectual life very seriously, art and uh, creative work and um, scholarship and physics. I mean, there's a reason why all these brilliant people come out of either Austria or Germany, Berlin or uh, Vienna, which I'm taking together as part of the larger. It's a, it's a legacy of the Habsburg Empire. Let's just put it very simply. And the same holds to a large extent, by the way, to, to the Russian people, Soviets, and people in, in Central Europe. They're very sober and seriously minded and uh, um, respect intellectual labor and creative work. Uh, and, and that's why most of the great work still comes from there. <laughs> um, yeah, Hollywood has had its has had its uh, day in the sun, but I think it's pretty much played out. Because you know what? The classic golden age of Hollywood is mostly intellectuals from Europe. <laughs> they were doing they were doing all the screenwriting and uh, the directors and the cinematographers, you know, Karl Freund was a cinematographer in, in Berlin and he was chased out of there and he went into American movies and he's the guy that pioneered the two or three shot setup in, in television. And he was the cinematographer of choice for guess who? Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, right? He's the guy, if you look on the old I Love Lucy show, it'll say Karl Freund, ASC, right? He's so you get my point there? The, today's movies are made by punks who come out of film school whose only reference point is other films, right? Now, Twin, Twin or Twittish or Twitter Tarantino didn't go to film school. He's too stupid and idiotic uh, in order to, I don't even think he went to, um, you, know, you don't have to go to college, but I mean, he didn't have any, any aspirations, which is fine. The point I'm making is he learned his filmmaking by being a video store clerk. That's what I'm really trying to say. And that's why you have Kill Bill. That's why you have all these really lame movies out that are about lame movies, right? Whereas in the old day, the classic day of the cinema, which by the way, this was made into a film starring Joanne Woodward, 
which I have to get. I have it on order. I have to watch the original and I have to watch the remake. And I guarantee you the remake's going to be a piece of garbage, whereas the original with Joanne Woodward is going to be excellent. And why do I mention Joanne Woodward here? Is because later on she was cast in a film adaptation of a best selling book called The Three Faces of Eve. That was Joanne Woodward. And she won an Academy Award for Best Actor. In 1958, the year after it came out, 57, we're talking about old movies here, but but in in art, there's no such thing as old or new. To me, it's all it's all the same. It's all present. It's all now. And uh, check it out if you can, or check it out if you will. But she was in that film, Three Faces of Eve, about three personalities. Right? We 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 talk about it's not, no longer called MPD, multiple multiple personality disorder. Now it's called dissociative identity disorder. And there's a lot of talk and writing about it. And there's these experts that are supposedly doing this work. And I'm not discounting them, but I'm, I'm, I'm always retaining a high level of skepticism, especially when, it, when the pharmaceutical industry and the psychiatric and psychotherapy industries are involved. And they are industries. By the way, Melissa, I always feel guilty when I, when I dump on <laughs> social workers and the psychotherapy industry and big pharma because I see that you have a license. You're a, a master of social work. Um, so please don't take it personally. I think uh, these professions, these pursuits do have um, a certain degree of importance in, in society. I'm arguing against the fact that we shouldn't allow these people, this particular cohort to run our lives and to create policy for us, for our families, for our children. I don't want a bunch of psychiatrists convening in some sort of small um, self-referential group at, at the American Psychiatric Association and coming up with legislation to guide our, to dictate our lives. That's where I draw the line. So if, if you need to talk to somebody and you can afford the the insurance or the personal help, then, you know, by all means, go ahead and do it. Um, I wouldn't spend my money that way, but, you know, who, who am I to tell you what to do? Uh, I do object to the fact that these people who came up with the civil psyops exploited the very woman that they wrote a book off of. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I do take umbrage to that. I'm offended. And for me, it's a microcosm of what takes place in, in the society in general, this psychiatric tyranny that's taken over our country. It's more insidious than this temporary biogenetic uh, concoction that's been putting out there, right? Because you can consent to that, but but this other stuff, you we really have very few uh, points of resistance. And in, and in fact, most people who would normally run away from people coming at you with a needle will go will run wholeheartedly with open arms to people who say, trust me, I'm a psychiatrist uh, or a psychotherapist, right? By the way, in the last uh, phase of my my storied career at the University of California, Davis campus, right? The secret power spot of all the UCs, right? <laughs> That's where Robert Malone comes out of, right? That's where they do all the monkey experiments, all the psychiatrics and all the pharmaceuticals. Man, your HIV, all of it. I was right in the belly of the beast. Right? Um, in my last phase there, I would, in, in all my lectures, I would wear a, a medical smock. I bought one off of Amazon, cost me $5.95 or something. I wore it, wore it there and I really didn't comment. And I was just kind of doing a little bit of theater saying, okay, am I credible now? Am I a, an authority? All it took me was a $5.98 medical smock ordered from the retailer that ate the world and now you're going to worship everything that comes out of my mouth aren't you okay a little bit of theater doesn't hurt they got the point uh, but they still go to student services and counseling that's what it was called at uc davis very well funded i told you they put in, start putting these psychotherapists in faculty offices right uh, and it's not because i got driven out it's because i was lecturing about this years before the hammer dropped and they started really pushing the psychotherapeutic, psychiatric approach to higher education. That's why you have all these crazy people running around. And I mean that in the clinical sense, crazy. 
<laughs> and I was surrounded by these psychotherapists. There's a guy, I've talked to mom before, his name's Stan Sue, in his in his sidekick, right? Odd job, Nolan Zane. They were their job was to pimp out all the Asian Americans. And there was a Mexican woman in Latina studies. Her job was to pimp out all the Latinas. And then there was a black woman in black studies who, who she was psychotherapist. Her job was to pimp out the blacks. Uh, they wanted to get everybody, right? They, they call it um, diversity. They call it uh, disparity. Oh, there's disparity in mental health. We're going to everybody have access to this, this uh, incredible uh, godsend, right, by these incredible people who most of them are crazier than, than a bat. Okay, so speaking of which, let me talk about women in the psychotherapeutic revolution. Some of you are going to get angry. Women are, and this is not me, but you just look at the the, the, the data. Uh, women are, are far way overrepresented as psychotherapists, right? That is their job in American society, at least. As I told you, Japan doesn't have psychotherapy, right? And, and most countries outside of Western Europe... Uh, don't really put much stock in it. I'm just telling you that because a lot of people think, oh, it's, it's a universal. It's just like um, Western science, medical science is it's a universal. What's wrong with these countries? Um, but women are way overrepresented because in the old days, the spinsters, the women, that's what they used to be called. The women who chose to be unmarried, maybe they might have been lesbians, who knows? But they were teachers. They were school moms. That was their role. But then after World War II, the gender roles started being redefined and women were beginning to capitalize on the fact of male absence. I'm not just talking about Rosie the Riveter. I'm talking about men who went off by the hundreds of thousands to fight over in the Pacific theater against the Japanese and the Chinese and the Koreans who were on the same side, by the way. World War II it was a multi cultural experience, both in the Pacific theater, where they had Malaysians, Filipinos, worked um, on the side of the Imperial Japanese army. And you had in, in the the uh, Wehrmacht in Germany, you had Africans, you had uh, Asians, Central Asians. Of course, you had Ukrainians. We know about that. But but the uh, Wehrmacht and Third Reich was multicultural so far as, as fighting is concerned, right? Makes it more complicated when you really look at the actual existing history. Well, women were the beneficiaries uh, in the area of psychotherapy because you had all these tens of thousands of men. Not all of them sought treatment, but a, a lot of them, a large number of them, went to the VA hospitals, especially in New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles. I mean, all the major cities had these huge, giant co complexes devoted to psychiatric care. And these were people, I guess they called it shell shock back then. Later on, it, you, you've seen the George Carlin routine about how it was uh, this and this, and then later it became PTSD. And, I, and again, I'm not trying to make fun of it, mock it, or minimize it. I'm just saying that all these syndromes, all these problems have social um, human origins. They're not coming from outer space and some wrathful God is visiting uh, his vengeance upon us. They're created by people, right? People who we give authority to, people with the white jackets, the white lab coats, right? So women like, um, her name is uh, Dr. Let's see, what's her name here? Yeah, her name is Dr. Corine, oh, Cornelia, Cornelia Wilbur. She became a medical doctor during World War II, right shortly thereafter. I think it's the University of Michigan. And uh, she went into psychiatry. And where she got her training were the only positions that she was able to go into were the least desirable. And that was the VA, where she had to treat hundreds and hundreds of, of men who had come back from World War II, who had seen incredible... Uh, brutality, and they might have committed them, engaged in these acts themselves with uh, decapitations and just horrific wounds and, and just uh, cannibalism in some extremes and visited upon women, children, animals, their fellow soul. I mean, you, you know, you have a kind of a basic idea of what I'm talking about. That's the institutional environment um, that um, the uh, psychiatrist, Dr. Uh, uh, Wilbur, why do I keep trying to blot out her name? It's me because I just learned it. Doctor, this is where Cornelia, she's known as Connie Wilbur. 
That was her institutional setting. It was also in the psychiatric hospitals where she got access and learned about through the incredible array of psychiatric drugs which were developed during wartime, right? You know about the biowarfare part of it, right? Some of you who've, who've been following the, the, the problems of the last two years or so. But a lot of that research was also for these psychiatric drugs that were going to be targeting not just the returning veterans, but also the larger American population, including the chillins, the children. And for that purpose, we had Dr. Anna Freud and her friend, Dr. Peter Neubauer, their, their whole interest was child psychology, ad, adolescent psychology, because they were trying to figure out ways to label the children of America in the Western world and pathologize them to put them on powerful psychiatric drugs. And I've been promising to do that work up on the book on the Sackler families, The Empire of Pain. I'm still reading that. It was an incredible book. This literature is coming out. We are in a renaissance of research, ladies and gentlemen. We are in a, an explosion of incredible work that only 10 years ago was written off as conspiracy theory. So all these legit, these publishers that would not dare look at my manuscript they're running they're running in my direction now right that's the penalty you pay with being a leader right you if you're a front runner you got all these people in the back of you drafting right they're 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 in the draft of the leader of the the head goose in the front so i'm i'm not complaining about it. i'm just telling you this is how it it works and my time's coming my time has arrived and uh and i'm taking you with me right to the top Cornelia Wilbur was a was a fraud. She was a psychiatric drug pimp fraud who was also involved in electroconvulsive therapy. All right, I'm just going right into it because we're running out of time. She would make house calls to this woman who they created this identity called Sybil, which some, if you're old enough, you remember Sybil, the best-selling book that was published in '74. And uh, three years later, it was made into a mini series. I think it was ABC Television Network, starring uh, Sally Field, who was the Flying Nun. This is when people started. Oh, Sally Field, she's a real actress. That's where she made her bones. And uh, and I mentioned jo Joanne Woodward earlier doing the Three Faces of Eve because she was the co-star with. Sally Field in Sybil. So people who had seen the earlier movie and read the book, they said, oh, yeah, jo Joanne Wilbert. It, she just kind of eases into this new second wave thrust of the Sybil psyop going on. That's Joanne Wilbert. And by the way, I'm reading this biography of uh, Paul Newman because most of you know that Joanne Woodward was married to him. Uh, he was married to somebody, a beard, uh, for a while, and then they uh, – shuttled her in Joanne Uber to be with Paul Newman. And they had a sort of a menage de quat with uh, her and uh, uh, Paul Newman and uh, a writer who you may know, uh, Gore Vidal and his longtime lover, Howard, Howard, whatever. This is in LA where they had all moved to LA out of Broadway. And they all studied, by the way, with um, uh, Mr. Method actor, Steve, uh, uh, Lee Strasberg. And Lee Strasberg was, was also part of this psychoanalytic push back in the 50s and he helped make it glamorous and make it make everybody and even people out in the midwest want to have psychotherapy and now today it's uh de rigueur for people to be under therapy and on and and be on some kind of treatment some kind of therapy right and again i don't mean to make fun or mock people who have problems probably induced by the therapist or the psychiatrist, right? It's called iatrogenic disease. I don't mean to mock you, but I, I'm just saying, read the information, look at the social history, and you will find your own cure in your own self. And that's not medical advice. That's, that's just reality. Start reading the novels, start reading these books, listen to my talks, start thinking which, how you, how you got to point A, how you got locked into the the clutches of uh, these uh, crazy ass psychiatrists like Dr. Uh, uh, Connie Wilbur, that was her nickname. Crazy ass, why, why do I call her crazy ass? Why do I call her manipulative? Why do I call her a pill pusher? Because she, well, I won't go into the backstory, but she knew this woman 
few years younger than her from the Midwest. They were both from the Midwest. They moved to New York for different reasons. For Connie Wilbur, she needed a job. She went to the VA. But Connie Wilbur is so manipulative. One of her patients, by the way, not in the VA or private patients, was a super wealthy heir of some fortune. And he was seeing her as a therapist while he was undergoing marital problems. He was undergoing a divorce and he had tons of money. So <clears throat> no sooner than he, the divorce was final, she married his sorry self, moved into his Park Avenue apartment. And she became an instant Park Avenue social celebrity psychotherapist, charging hundreds of dollars an hour to the likes of the students of, of, of Lee Strasberg, right? Or above. You could be a, in New York City. There was this one psychotherapist in 1950s dollars who was a millionaire because his, of his practice, right? And of course, it's not the same anymore because all, any Yahoo who wants professional aspirations like Dr. Todd Grande, my big rival on YouTube is Dr. Todd Grande. One day I want to be as big as Dr. Todd Grande. <laughs> um, you know, tons of these degrees are given out like candy, right? So everybody has a shingle out. Everybody's competing for, for patients. So everybody has to be pathologized. You got to feed the machine, right? But back in the old days when it was still kind of new, it was a novelty and it was cool, it was chic, it was intelligent, it was intellectual. Uh, these these uh, crackpots can can build practices pretty, pretty uh, quickly. And that's what happened to uh, Connie Wilbur. She's a gold digger. She married this guy, Park Avenue, and she was reacquainted with this woman named Shirley Mason, who they called Sybil. And she's giving her uh, money. She's promising to pay her tuition to medical school. She's promising to pay because uh, Shirley Mason, they're both intel highly intelligent women. Shirley Mason has aspirations of becoming a psychiatrist herself. It's called the wounded healer syndrome. People who are screwed up, you know, they often become psychotherapists or psychiatrists uh, because it's a way of working out their own uh, problems, at least according to that one, one theory. And again, I think people who are profoundly disturbed probably could use some psychiatric help. But most of us, you know, we can just cry in our beer and listen to sad music and say, oh, man, so-and-so screwed me over and I, I'm, I, she left me. I'm going to cry. You know, most of us can do that. You know, I'll listen to some country music or... You know, take a long walk and, and uh, just not eat very well and, you know, wake up every two hours uh, having slept like a baby that is waking up crying. And, you know, that's most you, you, most people can go through it. And most people have been through that. And we've never seen the inside of a psychotherapist office. And I hope never uh, to do so. And by the way, uh, someone told me once, the, psycho, the psychotherapist, the guy Stan Sue said, the reason why I'm so anti uh, psychotherapy is because I am crazy. <laughs> uh, he called me paranoid because I was talking about how in the future the there was going to be a bi biomedical takeover and the new world order. And, and I was laying it out. I was teaching this stuff and it was getting back to him. And he says, and he told me, Dr. Stan Su, psychologist, by the way, he's over at um, uh, that university, that fake university where that other woman was in who was um, creating, I forgot her name. Anyway, let me skip that. He told me in, in a, in a faculty meeting, he told me I was paranoid. So I said, Dr. Sue, is that your personal or your professional assessment? Anyway, you've heard that story before, but I'm never tired of, of telling that because, uh, the best way of dealing with these, uh, ass clowns is mockery and humor, right? In fact, that's how they were treated in the fifties when most of America still had their heads screwed on straight, they didn't buy the psychotherapy garbage. They said, oh, that's stuff for neurotic Hollywood film stars. That has nothing to do with us. In fact, if you watch the early television 50s, most of the psychiatrists, psychologists were given these heavy Germanic English accents and they were mocked. They were, they were made fun of and, um, you know, Professor Erwin Corey was a stand-up comedian. He had a whole act based on that. And then it all it changed overnight. It changed because, again, this is where I'm saying women and psychotherapy go together like a horse and carriage. They came up with this woman named uh, Dr. Joyce Brother, who's Jewish, by the way. Her name's Bauer. 
as I told you, this is this is very this is very much Jewish American female post-war type of phenomenon we're talking about here that has been more generalized to the world population. That's why they have the World Health Organization, the World Mental Health Organization, which not coincidentally is attached to the United Nations and NATO, UNATO, as as I call it, right? It's part of the New World Order. So you had this woman named Dr. Joyce Brothers, who wasn't even a real name, who won the, a question. There was this program, a quiz show. It was proven to be corrupt, by the way. It was called the $64,000 question. And every once in a while, you see some old people on TV. So, oh, that's the $64,000 question. Well, there, that's in reference to a show that was on where the grand prize was $64,000. If you got the correct answer, guess who won it? Dr. Joyce Brothers. And she was what? a psychologist, a psychotherapist, right? And so that's when America, all overnight, thanks to TV, when another uh, psycho, psyops um, piece of machinery, which, by the way, was pioneered out of, out of Germany. They knew what they were doing, <laughs> right? All them alpha waves, you know, that entrainment, right? And so Dr. Joyce Brothers turned, turned it around, and she had a long, many decades career trying to be the kind, helpful face of psychotherapy in American society. Man, she needs a movie done. Maybe I'll ask uh, Barack Obama, who has a big contract at Netflix, say, uh, Mr. President, uh, I, you don't know me. I'm a nobody, but I want to do the uh, uh, biopic on Dr. Joyce Brothers and uh, go into her and show her what a big fraud she was. By the way, th there's going to be a new cycle of movies where all the great cultural icons and the scientists and the researchers that we grew up to worship, they're going to be totally demythologized. De 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 there's going to be a whole new cycle. That's where film is going to go right now, right? I'm telling you, you're going to make a lot of money if you're a, if you're a young film writer or screenwriter. Who, who wants to do write scripts about Dr. Joyce Brothers and all these other characters. Write about Doc, write a film based upon uh, Connie Wilbur and be like Ira Levin, make it into a novel. And uh, I'm giving you some pointers here. Uh, people who have, who are saying, well, I'm locked out. I, there's no place for me. All the boomers ruined it for me. They, they've, they've destroyed the economy. We're going to need to have a socialist economy now, thanks to the boomers. Well, uh, you've been fed a load of garbage. There's plenty of opportunities out there. If you just um, stop listening to the people in um, at the university in the counseling office, student service and counseling, and if you get lower the Prozac dose, maybe you'll make something out of yours. Otherwise, you're doomed. You're gonna you're gonna be there wetting your diapers in with Antifa and BLM, and worshiping people like uh, Kamala Harris and other miscreants, uh, AOC, that's that's the fate that awaits you unless you wipe your nose and uh, and start, you know, straighten up and fly right, as they said in my parents' generation, right? So you have all this multi, you know, this old <laughs> dissociate. <laughs> I did, I'm, I'm sorry for laughing about it, but it came such a huge psyop. We're still laboring. And, and again, I don't want to dismiss these books that have been out. We all, we've all read them. We all know them. We all feel for them. But, you know, we, we have to maintain a certain objectivity. Well, maybe their stories are true, but does that mean we have to accept Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, Wilbur's panacea? Because guess what? She took poor Sybil after promising her to pay her medical school tuition, 10 years. See, was it 10 years? I'll read you here what, what happened. Here it goes. It's page 105. It says, almost four years had passed since Shirley, otherwise known as Sybil, walked into Connie's office, Dr. Wilbur, as an upbeat graduate student. Boy, I know those people. I know those undergraduates with female gra undergraduate and graduate students who come in and, man, within a year, they're zombified and they're angry and they got green hair and they got piercings all over their face. And they're pissed off at me in particular because I'm a heterosexual male and I'm, you know, I'm a, you know, quote unquote, a minority. I'm supposed to be uh, sympathetic to the plight of uh, minority peoples. Uh, I'm sympathetic to the plight of everybody. But anyway, so after four years had passed since Shirley first walked into Connie's office as an upbeat 
upbeat graduate student with nagging but bearable emotional problems. Nagging but bearable emotional problems. That's the operative phrase right there by Deborah Debbie Nathan, who is a, and she's a good writer. She did her work. She's a great researcher, too. She found all these papers, by the way, in an archive. The John Jay School of Criminology had an archive of the of the research done there, and she found out it was BS that what they'd written up. She'd done her re that's a researcher. If you're on Google and you're doing Googles, you're not a researcher, you're a Googler. Okay, so let me read on. It says, now, after hundreds of hours of therapy and countless pills, shots, and machine-induced convulsions, ECT. Okay, this, this is Sybil now. After having undergone four years of that, she was a 35-year-old junkie who spent most of her time in bed and who, when she did get up, checked her mailbox for money from her father or walked the streets muttering to herself, right? She had become a mere hollow shell of herself induced by this quack doctor, this psychiatrist, a fellow female psych, uh, intellectual because she wanted to be a psychi psychiatrist herself and she was brilliant, but she knew how to work her credential into an empire of pain, just like the Sackler family did. So you got what I've re referred to at the top of this talk as the Sybil Psyopt, published May 22nd, 1973, became an instant bestseller, sold over 7 million copies over the next 10 years in the U.S. and around the world in translation. Uh, and guess what? This is interesting because I never really understood what happened to Dick Cavett. Uh, I grew up on the Dick Cavett show. I am, I'm not ashamed to admit, you know, I've always been a Dick Cavett wannabe. I wanted to have it, and it might happen pretty soon. <laughs> I wanted this through Skype or through StreamYard or remote, not in the studio, right? Um, but I, you know, I was, a, I, I thought he had a great show, but he disappeared all of a sudden. And now I understand what happened to Dick Cavett because I, I didn't know what happened. I didn't know the backstory. He had uh, he went into serious depression, and he uh, I, I read his biography, and to to this very day he's a, he's very much a proponent of powerful psychiatric drugs. He said it got him out of his black mood. It ruined his career, but it, his his mood sure did uh, improve. I'm sorry to be. It's a little bit snarky about that, but my argument is this: he never saw that 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 stuff, that material. And he was part of what, by the way, he's part of that whole Broadway um, celebrity milieu in New York. And the Dick Cavett show was, it came later, in, you know, in the seventies, I guess, seventy three, seventy five, seventy six. Uh, but there was that the whole psychiatric um, psyop was still very, very, very powerful, and he fell prey to that. Well, guess who showed up on the pre-publication to the Sybil bestseller to, to promote the book, right? It was the author, it was a journalist by the name of Flora Schreiber, age 57, and Dr. Cornelia Wilbur, age 64, showed up. And it was where? It was on the Dick Cavett show. That's probably where Dick Cavett probably was inducted into the psychiatric miasma that he never really came out of. Right. So anyway, there's um, uh, let me some other, some other low points here that um, <clears throat> that I wrote down verbatim. This is uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Wilbur says she would clamp the paddles. This is the ECT machines. She would clamp the paddles to Shirley's temples, twirl the dials and press the buttons. Shirley's body would arc and crash with convulsions. Connie's gadget was an old electroconvulsive therapy machine. She had retired years earlier. She got this at the VA, right? She got the training there when she was in a, a lowly VA MD, later to become a Park Avenue psychiatrist thanks to her wealthy husband. Con reading more. Connie's gadget was an old electroconvulsive therapy machine that she had retired years older, but she felt Shirley was becoming suicidally depressed, and Connie thought electroshock would help. But Nathan further writes, it is quite likely that all the drugs and electricity addled 
surely, erasing her short-term memory, generating frightening, frightening phantasms and causing blackouts. They also may have provoked new alter personalities because that was the premise of the book, uh, Sybil, that, that she had 16 alters, right? Sybil, otherwise known as Shirley Mason. But it was probably because of, this is what Nathan's saying, because of the ECT, because of the powerful psychiatric drugs. Even so, Connie was relentless. This is when Shirley Mason, no, I'm not going to do it. Stop doing this to me. I, I don't want treatment. I'm bowing out. I'm opting out. I don't keep your tuition money. I don't want to do the book deal with you anymore. Even though she, she was saying this, she was resisting. She was not giving her consent. Reading on with Deb, Debbie Nathan. Even so, Connie was relentless. This is Dr. Wilbur. Connie was relentless, administering pentothal round the clock. Shirley complained she was getting these injections when she didn't need them. So when I'm saying that Sybil PSYOP, I mean it, right? We heard all the hype back, and I was, you know, in college when this was going on. I was, I listened to it. I watched the movie. I didn't, I don't know if I read the book. I read that years later. Uh, and of course, as I told you before, I was, uh, in, as an undergraduate, thanks to Professor Morris Mandelman in political science, he was warning me about the uh, psychiatric establishment back in the, uh, in the seventies. And, uh, he didn't get tenure there. <laughs> they, they said, no, we, we want you to, to, to push forward this new psychiatric regime of control here. But he said, no. He says, I'm a humanist. I'm, I believe in the classics. He was, he was a classics person, even though he's in political science. But he came out of Berkeley, and they were the orthodox political science was moving into quantitative psychiatric if, uh, and, and Marxist combined uh, psychiatric control. And that's why he probably had to. He was pushed out of academia. Uh, but thank you, Professor uh, Morris uh, Mandelman, for warning me. And uh, you... You might have spared me a fate worse than death. Because after at that point, after your lectures, I was always on the alert. I was, and that's what I'm trying to do here, ladies and gentlemen. I was primed for all the different signs that you had you had uh, demonstrated to us in the uh, lecture hall. So um, we might return to this later when I get into the psychiatric uh, dim dimensions a lot of this by the before i finish here because this is i'm working up a talk on this later and i think i think we're going to return to debbie nathan later on uh as it turns out um columbia university was very much instrumental in this turnover to the psychiatric regime of oppression and mind control and especially the teachers college and I mentioned that today because most of the problem today, we're seeing the whole post-gender GLBTQ, uh, gender fluidity, Antifa. We're seeing all that coming out of the t uh, these schools of education, right? And, of course, uh, counseling, psychology, and schools. Those are the two power spots, right? Dr. Malone and those people are, are doing it from the laboratory perspective. The people who are doing it implemented implementing this regime on the qualitative level and the, and the the counseling offices are in the schools of education and the schools of, or the offices of counseling psychology and Columbia University, especially the teachers college in particular is one of those points of origin where a lot of these problems come from. And I'll explain why and how that came to be. And of course the practical outcome of, of of these talks that I'm giving is that we, the public, are, are going to have to militate for a thoroughgoing audit and a review of all these different public institutions. Even though they're private universities like Columbia, they receive public funds. So we as a public are not only entitled, but we're obligated to, to monitor and take a look at our social investment in these institutions. And I'll be glad to help lead the way. I'm pointing to you where the sources are where, because I, I I worked in the belly of the beast. I, I know where these problems are coming from. They're being engineered, right? I, I understand it completely. And I'm doing the research and I'm seeing how it's manifested itself in the popular culture. So uh, for those of you who have are who are watching, who are in these larger institutions, who have been studiously ignoring me and trying to ignore me and you want to promote other people like Dr. Todd Grandy, 
you want to put your bet on me, Professor Hamamoto and cultural forensics, because you know what? This is where the future lies. The future lies in the truth, or as I prefer to call it, the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. Thank you for allowing me to ego trip and talk in such grandiloquent, grandiose terms. Maybe I'm just bugging out. I'm suffering from delusions of grandeur. <laughs> or maybe I feel so bad about myself that I have to promote my genius. And that's not really that at all. I could, you know, I could care less. I would, I'm just content reading uh, my Edgar Allan Poe and Dennis Wheatley and, uh, all these great writers of the past and present. I did and watching movies and playing, listening to music. But no, I have a responsibility. You invested in my career, so I'm giving back to you. We're gonna get out of this mess. We're gonna, we're gonna all these fools that were that they laugh on in these shows, they laugh at. That's all they can do, right? Ben Shapiro, the auctioneer, Stu Peters. A Dan, that's all they can do is laugh. That's all they can do. I'm about solutions. We're going to get rid of them. We're going to expunge them. And we're going to replace them with health. We're going to place them with prosperity. We're going to place them with intelligence. Right. And Freud was horrified where psychology and psychiatry was going in America. He said, no, I'm German. <laughs> I'm serious about And he Subscribe to the tragic vision of life. He was he, he didn't believe in Disneyland, right? He didn't believe in the shiny, happy people. He didn't believe that that we are entitled to happiness and self-fulfillment. He just said we have to slog through life. It's not easy. It's not, it's not gonna be easy. And there's no there's there are no panaceas, psychotherapy, drugs, whatever. You can watch all the Netflix, you're just gonna be more miserable than ever. You're just gonna have to learn about tragedy in life and how to deal with it on your own. And I, and that's the Freud that I, the original Freud, the Freud himself, not his Neo-Freudian, uh, the people who, who are using his name, but I'm talking about Sigmund Freud, the real thinker, the person who, who understood that we need a certain degree of self-control and repression in life. He wrote, right, uh, Civilization, and it's discontents. He said, you know, in order to have civilization, you're going to have to exert some self-repression, some self-control. We just can't have a bunch of people running around the light and fires and having sex in the streets and painting their face and going to Woodstock and, and, and slogging around in the mud, right? If you want to have a, a civilization of some sort, you're going to have to exert some control, self-control. And most of it comes from, well, all of it comes from your parents, your grandparents, which is one of the reasons why the neo-Freudians tried to destroy the family so the state can take control of that and create the Antifa orphans and the BLM orphans and all these other people, the GLBTQ orphans. They've, they've destroyed the structure as part of this larger control grid. I've way exceeded my time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your patience. I'll be back with you, God willing, on Thursday. Thank you very much. Hey, it's so good to be back with you here on the Professor Hamamoto channel. Thank you so much for supporting me. I appreciate it. Bye.